uh, um, I might disappoint you. So uh, you might want to look unto the Lord, not unto me. <laughs> One of the things I love doing uh, is taking long drives. I, I take long drives not just for the sake of driving, but because I love uh, in, enjoying the flora and fauna, the panoramic views, the beautiful countryside of New Zealand. It's a beautiful country. And I will most likely will stop, uh, capture the moment, take a few photos of the landscape. I will not take any selfies, just the landscape. Take it all in. And a journey that would probably supposed to take two hours would end up taking double the time, about four hours. And when I get back home, I am refreshed, I'm rejuvenated. I love those drives. Now, since early this year, we have been on a journey, a similar journey, on the Salmon on the Mount, and we took the scenic route. Uh, if you read the Sermon on the Mount, which is found in Matthew 5, 6, and 7, just three chapters, if you were to read it in one sitting, it would only take you about 10 minutes. But it is going to take us about 40 Sundays to go through these three chapters. Now, my hope is that you are enjoying and being inspired as well as being encouraged and challenged as we are on this journey. This journey started in Matthew chapter 4, verse 17, where Jesus said to his listeners, remember he's just on a hillside on the northern side of the Sea of Galilee, seated there, and as it was that those days, uh, the teacher would sit and the people would stand, not what we're kind of doing now, it's the opposite. And he started by calling the people to repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. He's telling them, if you want to be a kingdom citizen, this is what it looks like. It starts by you changing your ways. Repent means that you are going south, and you get off the highway onto the exit and you turn around and start going north. You change, repent, for the kingdom of God is here. And having done that, then now he starts giving the characters and the values of what it means to be a kingdom citizen, what it looks like to follow Christ. And he starts expounding and explaining this thing that looks very countercultural. For your everyday listener, what Jesus was saying was kind of upside down. And even for us today, some of the things that Jesus has been saying to us are counterintuitive. In the last two months, we have been camping on uh, specific six statements that Jesus made. And what he was doing in this section of the Sermon on the Mount, he was trying to correct some misinterpretation of the text, of the law of Moses. Some things that had been said and all the people knew about, but had been misinterpreted. And Jesus is saying, hey, I want to correct that. He is going not just to the a letter of the law, but to the spirit of the law. He is interested in the people's hearts. And so now we get to the last of the six statements. Let me just give us a quick recap of those statements. Each statement started like this. You have heard it say, but I tell you this. And the first one was, do not, do not murder. But he's telling them it's not enough just to avoid killing. You must also avoid hatred and anger. Then he went ahead and talked about do not commit adultery. He's telling them it's not enough to avoid adultery, but keep your hearts from lust and be faithful. 
Then he went ahead and talked about divorce. He's telling them it is not enough for you just to be legally married, but leave out your marriage commitments. Then he went ahead and talked about do not break your oath. Keep your oaths. But you must also avoid casual and irresponsible commitments, especially to God. Then last week, Dave Clancy brought about revenge, eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. It's not enough to seek justice for yourselves. You must also show mercy to love others. And today, we get to the sixth statement. Jesus is saying, I want you to think about your enemies and what it means to love them. Is that even possible? Matthew chapter 5, verse 43 to 48. You've heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you in order that you may be sons of your father who is in heaven. For he causes his son to rise on the evil and the good, and he sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. For if you love those who love you, what reward have you? Do not even the tax collectors or tax gatherers do the same? And if you greet your brothers only, what do you do more than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? Therefore, you are to be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Let us pray. Good and gracious Father, your word is alive, your word is active, your word is effective. It's sharper than a double-edged sword. It is sharper than a surgeon's knife cutting to the deepest parts of our nature, laying bare, laying open all that is within us, whether it be doubt or defense. Nothing and no one can resist your word. But Lord, your word also comforts. It's like a healing balm that revives the soul. And so, Lord, I pray that your words will do its work. For what we are not make us, what we do not know teach us, all for our good and for your glory. Amen. Thank you. So, <clears throat> who is your enemy? In this text, Jesus is responding to our misrepresentation of an Old Testament command to love your neighbor, which was, uh, it is found in uh, Leviticus chapter 19, verse 18, and also verse 34. So he's trying to correct that. What uh, people had started saying is that you should love your neighbor as you love yourself. But then Jesus says, you have heard it say, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Now, neighbor is not just friends and brothers. And one of the reasons we know Jesus thought it was not to be interpreted, neighbor was not just to be interpreted as merely as friends or brothers or comrades, is that later on in Luke chapter 10, verse 29, when he was asked, Hey, Jesus, who's my neighbor? He answered by telling the story or the parable of the Good Samaritan. In that parable, the man who loved was a Samaritan, and he loved a wounded man who was Jew. Now, if you know a little bit about what was happening there, the Jews and the Samaritans were anything but brothers, anything but friends, anything but comrades. 
they had nothing to do with each other. Why? Because there were religious and racial hostilities between the Samaritans and the Jews. So Jesus just doesn't say, I have given you two commands. One that you love your neighbor, and then the second one is that you love your enemy. No. What he's saying is that I have given you one command. Love your neighbor. And I mean, even if your neighbor is your enemy. What does it mean by enemy? What kind of enmity does Jesus have in mind? From the context of the text that you have just read, an uh, enemy is a wide range of, it is a wide definition. It ranges from very severe opposition to someone just snubbing you. Notice some of these things. And as we do this, as you start noticing these things in this text, as I walk us through this text, I want you to do something for me. Ask yourself, who in your experience comes closest to being an enemy? And by praying that God will use his word even now to give you the heart to love him. Can you do that for me? Actually, do that for your own sake. <laughs> the first is those who persecute you. And see that in verse 44. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. So clearly, by enemy, Jesus means people who oppose you and people who try to harm and hurt you. Persecute means to pursue with a harmful intention. It might include very severe hostility, like the hostility Jesus faced on the cross. Jesus says, yes, love those who pursue you with harmful intentions. Love them. If they take away your home, your house, your family, your mother, even your children, love them. If they destroy your business, your reputation, love your enemies. Be that kind of person who loves the enemies. April this year, the great country of Rwanda was commemorating 30 years since the genocide of 1994 where about 800,000 people were killed in a hundred days while the world, the world was watching. One of the most unfortunate things that happened on this side of the century. I was reminded of the story of a Rwandese pastor called Biamungu Emmanuel, who survived the genocide and fled to Uganda as a refugee. Nearly his entire family was murdered during the genocide. So he wrote his testimony, and I just want to read his story to you. I am called Pastor Biamungu Emmanuel, and this is my testimony before I got saved. I was born on March 8, 1988. And I grew up in a family that did not know Christ. They were non-believers. I grew up in that situation knowing nothing about salvation and how a person can get eternal life. This is what happened to me in 1994 during genocide that took place in Rwanda. My family was completely destroyed from my grandfather and many of my relatives. And I remained with only my mother and my sister, who is now staying in Kigali. My mother was shell-shocked, and she has never recovered from this incident. And she remains with mental problems to this day, because of the murders. 
I grew up with a spirit of revenging to those who had killed my family and relatives. As I went through high school, primary school, and later in high school, my desire was to revenge the death of my relatives. I wanted to join the army so that I can take revenge. But I couldn't study well because my heart was broken. And my mission of joining the army failed. But since a friend of mine had secured a scholarship for me, encouraged me to pursue a degree in law in Kampala, Uganda. And then I decided that I will pursue this degree with the idea that I'll be the kind of lawyer who takes revenge on those ones who killed my family. But somewhere along the way, I picked the Bible and started to read it. Something shifted in me. I don't know when and how, but I know I love Jesus and something was changing in me to the extent I decided instead of going to law school, I went to Bible school. Day by day, transformation took place in my life. No one preached to me the gospel, but I knew that I believed what I was reading and the Holy Spirit touched me in a way I couldn't expect. And I allowed him to take control in my life. After reading Romans 3.23, I was convinced, convicted that not only those who killed my relatives are sinners, but I too am a sinner. I'm a terrible sinner. And again, the Bible tells us even to love our enemies. To understand this was very hard for me. But slowly by slowly, God changed me in, this, in his own way. I spent three years in Bible school. And before my graduation, I went back to Rwanda. I called my mother and sister. And I began to teach and tell them how God had transformed my life. They were amazed because they saw the change in me and how I had a forgiving heart. They were, um, uh, I, I preached to them and told them how Jesus took away our sins and put them on the cross so that we, cannot, so that we can get eternal life. They received the message and believed that the Bible says what the Bible says. But when I told them to forgive those who killed our relatives, it was hard for them to accept. So I kept praying for them that God will change their hearts. Later, they came to believe what I told them. So I called those who killed my family to our home so that we could forgive them. Even though it was not their request of forgiveness, but I called them any less. We, had, we cooked a meal for them, shared food and drinks, and then I opened Romans 3.23. Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. When I shared this with them, we all started crying. We forgave them. They forgave us. We also asked them to forgive us because we were in the process of revenging on them and especially their children. We embraced each other and I prayed for them. And after two weeks, I went to attend my graduation back in Kampala. From that time on in 2010 to this day, my mom has been sharing with the so-called enemies. I thank the almighty God who sent Jesus Christ to save me. But now I am a child of God, a new creation. No judgment is on me. And I believe that Jesus Christ will not leave me. Glory be to Jesus who saved me. And he has given me a beautiful wife and, and one daughter. My hope is that Jesus Christ who saved me while I was a terrible sinner will not fail to save others through his powerful blood. Pastor Biamungu Emmanuel, April 2019, at Rutare, Uganda. 
Biamungu's testimony applies what Jesus said in verse 44. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. So what does it mean by enemy? What kind of enmity does Jesus have in mind? Those who persecute you, number one. But secondly, those opposing you in less dramatic ways. And you see that in verse 44. <coughs> it reads, He, God, causes his son to rise on the evil and the good, and he sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. The evil and the unrighteous are people who defy the laws of God. They resist his will. They do not submit to his authority. And a lot of these people do not admit that they are God's enemies, yet they live as God's enemies. They would resent being called God's enemies. But Jesus mentions them to illustrate God's love for his enemies and our love for our enemies. So in another way to understand these enemies in this passage is that they are people who are repeatedly going against your desires. They may not call themselves enemies, you may not call them enemies, but they resist your will. They are contrary and antagonistic. In this sense, the enemy might be a rebellious child. He might be an uncaring, non-listening, ill-tempered husband. He might be an irritable neighbor who's always complaining about how you're not keeping your garden nicely. Jesus says, love them. But what else does Jesus mean by enmity? It is those who persecute you, those opposing you in less dramatic ways, but anyone who doesn't love you or is not your brother. See that in verse 46 to 47. If you love those who love you, what reward have you? Do you not do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet your brothers only, what do you do? Uh, what do you do more than others? Here in verse 46, the enemy, enemy is anyone who doesn't love you. If you just love those who love you, you are not loving the way. I just commanded you. And in verse 47, the enemy is anyone who is not your brother. If you greet your brothers only, you not only, you are not loving the way I just commanded you. So the point seems to be, don't stop loving because the person does things that offend you or dishonor you or hurt your feelings or anger you or disappoint you, or frustrate you, or threaten you, or kill you, love your enemies, means keep on loving them. Keep on loving them. What is this love? What is this love? Now, I'm going to work on the text, but I'll kind of work backwards. The key to understand what Christ is talking about here, love, which at times is translated as agape in Greek, is not the kind of love about just emotions. It is doing things for the benefits, for the benefit of another person. That is having unselfish concern for another and a willingness to seek the best for another. And this is how it looks like. It is with the simple thing as greeting them. Something as simple as greeting them. Verse 47. Verse 47. Loving your enemy means something as simple and gracious as greeting them. Greeting them. If you greet your brothers only, what do you do more than others? Greeting your non-brothers or non-friends is one form of the love Jesus has in mind here. Now, this may seem utterly insignificant in the context of those ones who persecute you, who want to kill you. 
But Jesus means that for this text, this text needs to apply in all of life. So I have a question for you. Whom do you greet after you leave this service? Only those who greet you? Only those who are your close friends? Only those who you know? Jesus says, greet not only those you know, but even those ones who are at odds with you. And of course, you should deal with the tension between the two of you. Love your enemy means something as simple as greet them. But it is not just greeting them. It means also practically meeting their physical needs. Verse 45. God causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. In this case, love is very practical efforts to meet a person's physical needs. Sunshine and rain are the two things that things need to grow so that there will be food for human life. This is the kind of thing Paul said in uh, Romans 12, 20, and he was quoting uh, Proverbs 25. He says, if your enemy is hungry, feed them. And if he is thirsty, give him a drink. For in so doing, you will, keep, you will keep burning coals over their heads. Do not overcome, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Loving your enemy means practical acts of helpfulness in the ordinary things of life. God gives his enemies the unrighteous sunshine and rain. You and I give our enemies food, and water. Loving our enemies is the simple thing of greeting them, practically meeting their physical needs, but also praying for them. And you see that in verse 44. I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Pray for your enemies is one of the deepest forms of love because it means that you really want something good to happen for, to them and for them now you can do you can greet them you can do nice things for them but when you are actually coming before the lord and saying lord i want good things to happen to these people who are my enemies that's a different level Prayer for them is in the presence of God, in the presence of God, bringing, bring interceding for them also changes your heart. I remember those are, uh, in the 90s, there was a time there was a campaign called uh, 30 Days of Prayers for Your Enemies. And really what that would do is that as you kept praying for those people who were, you considered your enemies or who you actually do not like or they do not like you. The more you prayed, the more it changed your heart. And yes, the Lord can change them, but you have no control over that. What happens is that he changes you. Pray for those who don't agree with you. Pray for those who hurt you, who harm you, who oppose you. Pray for your enemies. What would that look like for you today? Hear what Jesus said when he hung on the tree, when he hung on the cross. He says this in Luke 23, 24. Father, forgive them. Who? The very people who had battered and bruised and beaten him. Forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. Then there is Stephen in Acts chapter 7, verse 60 been brought out the first Christian martyr. He was a deacon and he was being stoned to death. What were his last words? Lord, do not hold this sin against them. 
Listen to those prayers. Examples of obedience to Jesus' command, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Jesus is calling us not just to do good things for our enemies, like greeting them and helping supply their needs. He's also calling us to want their best and to express those wants in prayers when the enemy is nowhere around. Our hearts should want their salvation. We should desire that our enemies will make it to heaven. We should be praying that at the end of time, we'll be standing shoulder to shoulder with them, praising the Lord. That's a different kind of prayer. And a different kind of intercession. When you make those kinds of prayers, it reorients your hearts your heart and perspective. But what, what, where does the power to love like this come from? Jesus ends this section with some very, the very amazing but also very challenging statement. He says, therefore we are to be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. You see, if a man or a woman would uh, live the way Jesus has told us to live in Matthew chapter 5, he or she would be perfect. Think about it. You'd be the kind of person who does not hate. You'd be the kind of person who does not slander. You'd be the kind of person who does not speak evil of another person. You'd be the kind of person who does not have lust in your heart. You would never covet anything. You'd never make false oaths. You'd always be completely truthful. You'd be a truthful man. You'd let God defend your personal rights. And you didn't take upon yourself to defend your own personal rights. You'd always love your neighbors and even your, uh, your enemies. How do you measure up to that standard? None of us in this room, and anyone joining us online, none of us measures up to this standard. Yet Jesus chooses to end this section with these words. Now, what was the greatest thing that Jesus ever did? He died on the cross to be a such, uh, a, as a substitute sacrifice, the sin of humanity. He took upon our sin, our shame, our, shame, our guilt, and nailed it on the cross. So why doesn't Jesus talk about dying on the cross in his greatest sermon? Kind of bizarre, right? Jesus, why don't why don't you why didn't you think to mention that in this sermon? I think this is what's happening. Jesus had the purpose in mind to prepare men and women to receive what he would do on the cross. He would prepare them by ruining their confidence in their own good works. We cannot measure up to these standards unless Jesus does something on the cross for you and I. And when Jesus Christ dies on the cross, then he imputes his righteousness upon us. And God the Father is able to see us through the, the blood of Jesus Christ. And then and only then, 
the, do we start having the power to live as Christ would have us live? Jesus says, I went to the cross for you. Put your trust in me. Put your confidence in me. And I will give you the gift of my righteousness in your life. Let us pray. This is a hard teaching. When you consider all the people who don't like us, not enthusiastic about us. When we consider those ones who hate us, yet you are asking us to love them. To love them in a way that is to their benefit. Lord, this is hard. So Lord, we pray that you'll help us. But we know it's not just about our will and our minds. And this will take the very person who has given us these standards to help us in loving those who are opposed to us, those whom we dislike or dislike us. So Lord, give us a compassion that you had for us as human beings, that you even went to the cross. Lord, fill our hearts with love, your love. Grant us wisdom in how to live out this words that you have given to us. And Lord, I pray that all our confidence in doing these things will not be in ourselves, but in and through you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.